The Lord be with you and also with you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship today at St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church. Whether you are here with us in person or by way of Zoom, we're glad that you're here and that we are safely back together on the other side of Hurricane Francine. Please remember this morning, if you haven't been with us for the past few weeks, that we are in the middle of a sermon series that is taking us through the month of September. Taylor Allen and Mary Catherine Allen and I are preaching this month on some of the spiritual thinkers and writers who have impacted and informed our understandings of spirituality and the Christian faith. Today I'm focusing on the poetry of Mary Oliver, a 20th and 21st century poet that we've studied at least twice over the last two years in our congregation, those sessions being led by the great and highly favored Peggy Brown. Now, Mary Oliver, if you're not familiar with her, she was a Pulitzer Prize winning poet who lived from 1935 to 2019. She grew up outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and she and her longtime partner, Molly, lived a long stretch of their lives in Provincetown, Massachusetts, outside of Boston and near Hyannis and Nantucket. Oliver was known for her poetry about nature, which is the reason for our first scripture reading that you'll hear in a few moments. But more than that, and as I'll discuss in our sermon, Oliver's poetry is infused with a contemplative type of mindfulness through which she speaks more over the years of finding God in her experiences in nature and making her something of a person of fond interest to many progressive Christian folks over these last several decades. Our liturgy for today has largely been shaped or adapted from her writings, as you'll see, and we'll consider all of this as we move forward this morning. And so now let us now turn to the first poem I ever experienced by Mary Oliver some 17 years ago in a worship setting much like this, also in the call to worship. And so let us call ourselves to worship now, and we'll do so using the printed words found in your bulletin. I will read the non-bolded portions and we'll all read the bolded parts together. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention, then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, our hearts are filled with gratitude. We are grateful for having weathered not only the recent natural storm of nature, but personal challenges that can upset our equilibrium. We are grateful for our resilience and courage in challenging times. We are thankful for compassion and empathy to be able to see beyond our own circumstances to work to address the needs of others. Help us to appreciate and use our many blessings that we may be strengthened to serve our neighbors. Amen and amen.
The first reading is from Genesis, chapter 1, verses 20 to 25, and it's on page number 1. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And so it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. For our prayer of confession today, please stand with me this morning as you're able and as you're comfortable. Now you'll notice that there is no regular prayer of confession found in the regular spot in the liturgy. But if you flip forward a page, you'll find Mary Oliver's poem, Wild Geese, which we will be reading. Now, a few words before we get there. In the Christian tradition, most mainline churches usually incorporate a prayer of confession in our liturgy in which we confess and acknowledge our brokenness and our sin before God and each other. And that is a good thing to do, lest we become prideful or unable to recognize that we have the capacity to hurt others or ourselves. But there are certainly traditions, how should I say this, there are traditions which so emphasize humanity's guilt and shame and lowliness that it can cause us to lose sight of or not trust in God's love for us and the sacred worth and value that God imbues within us. So while it is good to confess our sin from week to week and we'll continue to do so, we'll also take a break from that this morning. This will make sense in a moment. And we're going to read one of Mary Oliver's most popular poems that reminds us that our ultimate worth and value is not measured by our failures or our ability to be good, but is instead rooted in something more fundamental. So for now, if you will, I will read Oliver's poem aloud, and you can read silently along with me if you'd like, or you can simply listen. But please now just relax and listen and receive this blessing from Mary Oliver. This is from Wild Geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. Amen. Friends, in God's mercy, there is a balm that heals the weary soul, and in Christ's love there is forgiveness for those in need. And so trust today that you are forgiven and you are beloved. And through this love of Christ, may we forgive one another 
And may we do the things that make for peace in our world. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let us share signs of God's peace with one another. Our second reading today comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 9 through 15, found on page 538 of your pew Bible. I selected this this morning because it reminds me of a constant theme that runs through Oliver's poetry in which she encourages her readers to be unafraid to find pleasure and joy in the world no matter what's going on around us. And this seems to always be a good word for what feels like tumultuous times. So here now, this morning, this reading. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. God has made everything suitable for its time, moreover. God has put a sense of past and future into their minds, yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. But I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and to enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already is. And God seeks out what has gone by. Amen.
our time of giving now, I'll invite our ushers to come forward for the morning. And as they do, uh, please, as always, give as you're able or as you're comfortable, and please give with the spirit of generosity and joy. Please know that for all the ways in which each of you give back to the life of the church, that they are all appreciated and valued. Amen. As we come now to our time of prayer, let us begin this morning as we do by holding a time of sacred and intentional silence, after which today I'll lead us in spoken prayer, and this morning as we do occasionally I will guide us through a series of petitions, and after each one we'll hold a few seconds of silence for you to conjure in your mind people or places that you would like to pray for, but after which I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and we'll all say together, hear our prayer. Following these petitions, we'll have the Lord's Prayer, which we'll also say together and which may be found printed in your bulletin. Friends, let us pray. Loving God, we bring before you now the concerns of our hearts, 
We bring both our joys and the things that have left us feeling tender or wounded or worried. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, this morning we bring before you others we know who are hurting this day. Those who are lonely or sick or anxious. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we bring before you all the people who have been impacted in some way by Hurricane Francine. We give you thanks for the generosity of those who had the capacity to help others and for all of those who showed patience and mercy to stranger and neighbor alike. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we bring before you others across the world, especially those who continue to live in places marked by the absence of peace. We remember also all of those who live in war-torn places and places where human life is devalued or placed at risk. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, for all of the abundant mercies in our lives, for any of the ways that we may grasp beauty or feel inspired to continue on in our journeys, for the things and the people who bring us joy and respite from hard times. We give you so much thanks, and we pray together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, gracious God, in the quietness of this moment and in the love that draws us together and near to you even now, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
This morning, our third reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, and it is, I recognize, a text that we traditionally read during Advent or near Christmas. The text is what we refer to often as Mary's Magnificat, or the song of Mary, mother of Jesus, in which she is pregnant and she rejoices about what God has done for her and is doing through her for the world and for the people of Israel. I have partly chosen this text today because I find it at least a little poetic, maybe a little corny, to have Mary, mother of Jesus, in conversation with Mary Oliver, Mary speaking to Mary across the ages, perhaps. But also, of course, there are themes that I find in Mary's Magnificat that I think we also find in Mary Oliver's poetry, themes that have been greatly influential in my own life, and I think that perhaps they could be or already have been for many of the rest of you as well. And so then let us hear now from the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter, verses 46 through 56. This is found on page 832 of your pew Bible. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For God has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant, Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is God's name. God's mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. God has shown strength with his arm. God has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise God made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth, her cousin, for about three months and then returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The writings of Mary Oliver are known for many things, but a primary gift that Oliver distilled and practiced and gave back to the world was her ability to slow down and to pay attention and to be present to the world around her. The irony then was not lost on me that yesterday, as I was busy fretting about this sermon, which had yet to be finished, dare I say, started, it was not lost on me that I was being anything but slow and attentive and present to the world around me. Now, yesterday was a lovely day filled with many good things, but perhaps I was overly ambitious in what I planned to accomplish. I intended to leave most of the afternoon and evening to writing this sermon, but then, and of course, as I was settling down to work and as I was putting on my thinking cap, I realized that there were a few necessary things to do that I had otherwise left undone. I had earlier in the day offered to help someone out in New Orleans East, which of course is a drive. And then, too, as I was about to leave for this task, Emily reminded me, thankfully, that I also had no longer a functional pair of dress shoes to wear to church this morning. A few days ago, during our hurricane traveling, one of my shoes, I only have one nice pair of dress shoes, but one of those shoes, let's just say, had completely fallen apart. The sole of the shoe had disconnected entirely from the side of the shoe, and a preacher cannot rightly sit in an elevated chancel area with one foot hanging out of a dilapidated and tattered shoe. Well, let it be known at that point in the afternoon, knowing the full scale of what lay before me, that whatever was left of my calm, restful, Mary Oliver-like serenity, it had now entirely evaporated. I was fretful, and I was anxious, and I was irritated with myself for being in my current predicament. 
But at some point during my drive across town, the good Lord above had mercy upon my soul, and I remembered that there was a recorded interview that Mary Oliver had given about nine years ago with Krista Tippett on Tippett's podcast called On Being. Some of you may be familiar with it. If not, I think anyone in this crowd would love it. And so in the midst of my frustration of trying to do these last few things, being neither mindful nor demure, I found that podcast and I put it on and I managed somehow in the car to take a deep breath. And I listened to Mary and Krista talk about the value again of slowing down and being attentive and being present to the world around us. And at one point in the interview, they discussed a certain poem that reoriented me yesterday, and that poem is called, I Go Down to the Shore, and it reads as follows. I go down to the shore in the morning, and depending on the hour, the waves are rolling in or moving out, and I say, oh, I am miserable. What shall, what should I do? And the sea says in its lovely voice, excuse me, I have work to do. (laughs) The point here that I was relearning yesterday in the moment is how easy it is to get caught up in what we feel to be the misery or the importance of our particular situation. And then in Oliver's case, the ocean with its endless cycles and rhythms, it kindly gives us a bit of cosmic perspective through which we might check our tendency to bloat or puff up the anguish of our own little microcosms, which is at least what I was doing in the car yesterday afternoon. Now that is but a humble tale of how Oliver's insights helped a poor preacher regain some equilibrium yesterday, but there is undoubtedly more to explore and to delight in today with Oliver's work. And to get into some of these things, I want to pair Mary Oliver, as mentioned, with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the song attributed to her that we just read as our third reading. And so on that front, let us first begin to notice this morning, if you will, How in the Gospel of Luke, in what should have been a fairly anxious time in her life, Mary opens her Magnificat by saying or singing that her soul instead magnifies the Lord and that her spirit rejoices in God, her Savior, the source of her and the world's salvation. On this theme of finding salvation, I want to first share with you a bit about how Mary Oliver also found salvation in the world around her and how she too rejoiced in God and how she magnified the Lord, we might say, through her poetry. And secondly, later in the sermon, I'm going to want us to look at the way Mary, the mother of Jesus, sings that God has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, that line in particular. And I want us to consider then Mary Oliver's own more humble approach to spirituality and how it might be helpful for us today. First about salvation. Mary Oliver shared publicly only later in her life as she was often a very private person. She shared later in life that as a child she grew up in a traumatic and an abusive household. And in light of the painful experiences that she had in her home, Oliver shared that she found safety and respite from the anxieties of her childhood by literally getting out of her childhood home, getting out of the house and spending time out in nature and out in the woods and out in places that were beyond the walls and the difficult circumstances of the house in which the trauma was occurring. Mary Oliver came later to say that it was the beauty of the world that saved her. The natural world in particular, this and its beauty were the spaces in which she reoriented her life away from the pain of her home and in her own way over time she began to learn something healing about the deeper rhythms of the earth and the created order in which she spent so much time. 
And while Oliver was never conventionally very religious in the popular sense of that word, she would find language to say and firmly believe that she encountered God or the Spirit by slowing down and paying attention and being present to all of the natural beauty that was around her, the miracles of life, big and small, that are always in front of us, but often so hard to see if we don't take time to notice. This salvation that Oliver found, it's reflected in her deep meditations on the beauty of the natural world, the poetry for which she is most well known, even for people who do not go to her looking for a word about spirituality. As a theologian, I might say that Mary Oliver was working out her salvation, as she herself said, and she did this maybe less with fear and trembling as with the Apostle Paul and more so with awe and amazement and appreciation for the beauty of things like a sunrise or a white heron or fields of wild flowers, a gentle deer or the steady lapping waves of the ocean. We hear this in places where Oliver says, and I quote, of course I have always known you God are present in the clouds and the black oak I especially adore and the wings of birds. Elsewhere Oliver writes, O oh, feed me this day, Holy Spirit, with the fragrance of the fields and the freshness of the oceans you have made. Still elsewhere in a poem entitled Some Questions You Might Ask, Oliver writes and ponders about the nature of the soul asking about and wondering what exactly our souls are and why, she asks, in deference to the created order, why should humans say that we have souls but not other creatures and animals in the world that are made by God, as we heard in our first scripture reading this morning. About this, Oliver goes further and says, quote, come to think of it, what about the maple trees? What about the blue iris? What about all the little stones sitting alone in the moonlight? What about roses and lemons and their shining leaves? The world to Oliver, from the glory of the sun to the smallness of the grasshopper, from her beloved dog to a field of wild flowers, these all were capable of becoming transparent and showing us something of the spirit of the divine. If, again, we but learn to slow down and pay attention and be present to the beauty and the cycles of life that are in front of us every day. Now, all of this, Oliver's approach to finding the sacred within nature, this brings to mind for me a bigger conversation then and perhaps one of Oliver's bigger impacts on my own personal life. And this is what I would call her more humble approach to religion, generally speaking. Oliver, for as much as she put beautiful words together about God and nature, she would be among the first to claim that she didn't understand how it all worked, that the job of a poet is not that of a scientist or a theologian, and that while scientists and theologians, while we may have our uses, we modern people can also get too caught up in our search for or our need for rational explanations and answers and scientific understandings of how things in the natural world work. We often want to master things with our knowledge of them. And this desire for knowledge, it's not necessarily bad, says Oliver, it can be quite useful, but with the wisdom of a contemplative, she also understands that such heady approaches do not necessarily make any of us able to be more appreciative of mystery or beauty or to be able to find meaning and depth in the things that surround us in our world. I would compare Oliver's own humble approach to what Mary, the mother of Jesus, sang about in her Magnificat when she said that God scatters the thoughts of the proud, meaning here for me as a now humbled theologian that God is always more elusive and greater than what our favored words or texts or doctrines can capture. Religious people, Christians, and others can approach 
the Bible or sacred text as if they were scientific textbooks helping us demystify the glory of God, ironically, and telling us exactly how God works or who God favors, or we can become dogmatic and insist that our denomination or we ourselves know exactly how it is that the church or God must work. It's easy then to become caught up in fighting for these things or defending them against others. And what happens, I believe, in what Oliver's example in her life points us toward is that religion then, rather than being a vehicle that moves us toward actually experiencing God's grandeur in the world, religion then becomes another realm of knowledge or a practice for us to conquer and to lord over others. Mary Oliver, in other words, was no fundamentalist. And in that sense, I need to be careful here in what I say and also not christen and claim Oliver firmly as a church person or a devout Christian, as I don't think Oliver would ever claim this about herself. Oliver has shared that for as much as she weaves religious language into a wide number of her poems, she neither claimed a strict adherence to any particular religious tradition, nor did she actively participate in a particular church or congregation, not at least to my knowledge. Oliver shared very specifically that at some point in her childhood, she realized that there were certain doctrines of the church that if she had to believe them literally, then she couldn't do it. And so she didn't feel through most of her life as if she could fully participate or belong to the church. Oliver then was a questioning person. And as a recovering fundamentalist myself, I very deeply appreciate that about her. Nevertheless, Oliver says she always kept coming back to the importance of spirituality and faith in her life. Indeed, she would come to see the church when operating at its best as a great place for people to connect with their spirituality, as could be said for other religious traditions as well. What was important, Oliver would share, is that for isolated individuals, as the modern world often makes us feel, that religion and spirituality could help us see ourselves and Oliver, too, as having a place of belonging in the wider tapestry of nature and the world and the cosmos in which we live and in which God could be found, as we've already discussed. Finding one's place in the family of things as we heard in our prayer of confession, this is something that religion can help people do. And to that extent, Oliver always felt empowered to explore spirituality and prominent figures ranging from St. Augustine to the Buddha and to Rumi, the great Sufi and Muslim poet whom she said she read every day. But again, and what I would particularly appreciate about her approach to faith is how she would not allow herself to feel that she must mindlessly accept the dogma of any given tradition. And even more, she came to see that the point of religion is not about trying to wrap our heads around the dogma of a tradition, but instead religion can offer a way of loving and appreciating that which is directly in front of us from friends and lovers and children to neighbors and immigrants and people who are different from us to animals and flowers and live oaks to swamps and bayous and mountains. There is a humility here and it can be heard for instance in her poem titled Mysteries Yes in which Oliver writes Truly, we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of lambs. How two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look, and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. In another poem titled, When Death Comes, Oliver writes, I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy and as singular, and each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does toward silence. When it's over, or when death comes, I want to say, 
All my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened and full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world, end quote. In a poem titled, Sometimes Oliver writes, perhaps more simply about what I would call her approach to spirituality. She says, instructions for living a life. Pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. And still later in the same poem, Oliver prays, God rest in my heart and fortify me, take away my hunger for answers. Now, as we move toward a closing, I would finally say that I wanted to lift up Mary Oliver today because of all the things I've already pointed toward in this sermon, Oliver's delight in nature and her framing of spirituality as the ability to be humble and appreciative regarding the mysteries and the beauties of God in the world. But I also lift up Oliver more directly today because of her insistence on joy and amazement and openness toward the world. It is very clear in our world right now that there are pathways before us, some of which offer us a road that is mired with the muck of hatred and distrust and fear and disdain toward the other and the unknown. And still there are other pathways represented, I believe, by the likes of Mary Oliver and Eddie Hillisom from last week and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her rejoicing and her proclamations of justice. All of these, they remind us not to be anxious and not to let our hearts be troubled and to contend diligently with the problems of the world but still yet to never lose the ability to find joy and beauty for without these things, these saints know that our spirits will grow parched and will shrivel and that we will turn in on ourselves and others. And they teach us that this is indeed no way to live. And so this morning on that note, I will give Mary Oliver the final word about such things. And I'll read from you one last time a bit from her poem, Mindful, and may these words guide us in our common life together at St. Charles. Oliver writes, Every day I see or I hear something that absolutely kills me with delight, that leaves me like a needle in the haystack of light. It is what I was born for to look, to listen, to lose myself inside this soft world, to instruct myself over and over in joy and acclamation. Amen and amen.
Everyone, thank you for being here this morning. It's good to see you all again on the other side of all that was this week. Um, nothing too horrible we're grateful for. Um, this morning, of course, as always, there are refreshments back in the Harris Room, which is the space directly behind us. Uh, feel free to stick around and chat and get some sustenance if you would like as you go your way. Uh, the next two weeks, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, we are going to continue in this sermon series, and we are welcoming Taylor and Mary Catherine Allen to the pulpit, and that is going to be wonderful. We look forward to them. I will be leading us through worship, and they will be preaching. Uh, this upcoming Wednesday night, keep in mind that's September the 18th uh, at 5.30 p.m., we will have our potluck dinner. I believe there are sign-up sheets in the back. We're going to try to do a taco-themed evening um, so take a look at that uh, before you go if you're planning to come on Wednesday night also Alan Kamen will be with us we did this in July we we're going to have another Vespers service a jazz Vespers service in the chapel over this way whenever we wrap up uh, from our dining together around six or so we'll go over and do the Vespers service um, and we'll be done in plenty of time for choir practice later on that evening that is the plan we are uh, working on a new date for the listening session for the solitary garden. That was supposed to happen last Wednesday night, the night that Hurricane Francine was bearing down upon us. So we did not meet. We'll have another date uh, within a few days or so. We'll have that out and, and have that publicized in plenty of time. But we're working on that. And so that is coming. And the plan is still to build that out on September. September 28th and October 5th, so a few Saturdays down the road from now, and you're welcome to volunteer for that if you'd like. We can talk more about what that looks like uh, at the listening session. Also this Friday, Caroline Durham let me know that the Center for Faith in Action is co-hosting a viewing of a documentary at the Loyola Law School this upcoming Friday at 7 p.m. about, uh, the film is about the impacts of incarceration on children whose parents are in prison. There's a, a panel discussion afterwards. If you'd like more information about that, please reach out to me. Also, Caroline is here this morning, so you can uh, find her afterwards, um, but just know that that is happening. There are a few other center events happening in a few weeks, and we'll get that information in the bulletin too um, for next week as that comes up. Um, also remember that on September 29th, that's two Sundays from now, two Sunday evenings from now, is when we are going to provide a meal and worship with uh, NOLA Leslie Campus Ministry. And that is just a few blocks down the street at their, um, their meeting place, the Labyrinth. I'll have a direct address for you um, and a time. Last year we met around 5. I'm still waiting to hear back about that time. I imagine it would probably be 5 p.m., Again, so take that into consideration if you're planning on or think you might be able to help provide a meal that evening. We'll have a sign-up sheet also in the back for that so we can coordinate our efforts. I'm not going to take this much past September, so uh, that's a lot. And uh, just know that there are opportunities. There's more things that are listed in your bullets. And do, do take a look at um, and mark your calendars for the Blessing of the Pets and the Mabel Palmer Lecture Series where we're going to look at what's happening with the death penalty here in Louisiana. That's going to happen later in October. Friends, now as we go, receive this final benediction. And this is from a bit of Mary Oliver's poem in Blackwater Woods, which I offer back in memory of our late and beloved Bob Marie. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones knowing your own life depends on it, and when the time comes, to let it go. Amen, my friends.